Welcome to the Restitutor Orbis channel, and today I thought we would do an overview of Germany, or Germania as it was called in Latin. What's so unique about Germany? Why is this particular area so interesting to us? Well, when we look at it, we see that there are many remnants of incredible examples of architecture that existed from the past. We have unbelievable cathedrals and churches that dot the landscape. We have castles that have managed to survive numerous conflicts, and in fact, two of the greatest conflicts in recorded human history, at least the greatest conflicts that we know about. But why does Germany warrant so much attention from alternative researchers? In this exploration, we're going to talk about Germany overall, or Germania. Here we have the wondrous castle of Heidelberg. We're told it's a ruin from distant centuries past, yet at the same time something about it defies the classic explanation. For example, we're told that this castle was struck by lightning, not once, but twice. Yes, lightning struck twice in the same place and caused fires that left the castle in this unfortunate damaged state in Heidelberg, Germany. But what's the real story behind it? Was this lightning bolt a quarter mile wide? We're going to explore that. Everywhere you look across Germany, and we're examining photos from all the major cities with the exception of Berlin, which we looked at earlier this week in a silent video, you see the examples of architecture that seem very ornate and complicated. Yet at the same time, when you look at all the cities, every single one is a geometrically precise foundation structure in the old maps. The geometrically precise foundation structure, our term for what looks to be a base foundation that is very geometrically complex or what other researchers would call a star fort, and it does look like a star, and supposedly it did serve a fort purpose. Looking at some of the interesting images of Germany, though, you see very advanced architecture, and a lot of these images we're looking at come from Dresden, a city that experienced extreme destruction during World War II. And, of course, in the layout of Dresden, you also see the geometrically precise foundation structure. Now, is this de for defensive purposes? Well, that's what defenders in the mainstream will tell us. But we tend to look a little deeper behind that because what we see in these maps is that the geometrically precise foundation structure was just that. It was the previous civilization that was before the foundation eras, that is, this channel theorizes, came before the last civilization, or what we call the Tartarian civilization. Now, at the same time, that was a worldwide civilization. I'd also like to make it very clear that I will never refer to it as an empire, because I do not believe that it was an empire. Now, as time went on and Tartaria experienced its great defeat at the hands of its adversary in the Fourth Era, did it decline into warring states and empires? I believe that it did. For some reason, though, Germany seems to have survived fully intact, at least up until the First World War. And then it seemed to warrant a intentional destruction, not just from the air, but on the ground. Now, while there have been other areas of the lands that have experienced direct conflict, few have experienced as much direct conflict as Germany has, especially in the start of the 20th century. What exactly was the reason for that? Well, when you look at all these images and you see this advanced architecture, you get the impression of a civilization that had somehow survived or at least the remnants of the previous civilization that had survived, not only the reset, but then what we theorize is the reset conflict that followed the last reset from the fourth era to the fifth era, or our contemporary era. Every single one of these major cities in Germany, whether it's Hamburg, Frankfurt, Nuremberg, or Munich, all have these original maps that show this geometrically precise foundation structure. That's not a coincidence. Now, you could argue, well, the reason for that is that all these cities needed to be defended. But let's think about what we're told the capabilities of these medieval armies were in the official historical account. We're also going to take a look at what the official historical account tells us about Germany. And in summarizing that right now, we're told that Germania, in its earlier history, was originally a great opponent of Rome that the Germans managed to resist Roman expansion and that the Romans never actually conquered Germania, as they called it at that time. And why was that? Well, it's because the Germans had an intense sense of independence, that they had a tribal mentality, and they were able to resist Rome, while at the same time infiltrating their army. Indeed, the 
German leader Arminius, who there are still several monuments built to this day, or at least what we're told are monuments to Arminius, managed to trick the Romans into a punitive expedition and destroyed the 17th, 18th, and 19th legions. Yes, I am well acquainted with the mainstream historical account, and I do not accept it. Just letting you all know that. So when someone tries to tell you, or if anyone tells you you need to do more research, well, what they're really telling you is that you need to repeat the things that are already told to you that are probably fallacies. In any event, I don't settle for that because I find far too many inconsistencies. And when you look at these structures here, you'll be given many different narratives. They were built by this noble or that noble. They were built by this German prince or they were built by this sort of Roman interest at this time or that time. And that's how you explain all these conflicting architectural styles. And of course, because of the developed history of Germany, they had the time to do it. After the Romans and after resisting the Romans, Germany was ruled by a series of different tribes, Germanic tribes. And then gradually it evolved into the Carolingian Empire, which also included France. And then the Carolingian Empire split between the Eastern and Western Carolingian Empire. The Western Carolingian Empire became France. The Eastern Carolingian Empire eventually became Germany. The official history tells us that France managed to develop as a centralized and strong nation, while Germany continued to erode into a series of warring states, till a guy named Otto von Bismarck managed to unify Germany under the Greater German Solution, although it did not include Austria until that guy with the mustache came along. And I know I'm summarizing a lot of history with that, but the other interesting thing about Germany is we're also told that many of the very baseline philosophies that encompass our world or our lands, such as the economic systems, came from Germany. And here you can see a reenactment of the Great Battle of Teutoburg Wald, where the German tribes people under Arminius managed to defeat and destroy the 17th, 18th, and 19th Roman legions. We're also told that the Romans never fielded those legions again because they believed in luck. Yes. But why is it that we have this account that these philosophies started in Germany? For example, they practiced capitalism in Germany in the Hanseatic League, which we talked about in an early, earlier video. We're also told it's the birthplace of socialism and even communism with the writings of Karl Marx. Now, granted, they weren't practiced exceptionally, although we're also told conversely that they were, and they did. So why is it that Germany exists as the birthplace of these different philosophies? And we even have the great schisms in the Christian religion that started in Germany, supposedly, with the development and the advent of Lutheranism, and how the Lutherans stood up against the Catholic Church. And somehow that was allowed to persist for reasons unknown, but when the Albigensians rose up and the Gnostics in southern France, the Catholic Church responded very viciously and ruthlessly, according to the official historical account, and quickly massacred and destroyed the Gnostic communities. But I guess for some reason unknown, it was okay for the Lutherans to rise, and, you know, things just happen because they're supposed to happen. It's when you start to ask questions about the official historical account that you really realize there are many inconsistencies behind it. Germany is a place where this really stands out in grave detail. And in fact, back in my teaching days, it was where I started to get myself in trouble because I openly questioned a lot of these accounts that were given about Germany and how it didn't make any sense. Everything from how the fact that alternative religions rose in Germany, alternative political thoughts rose in Germany, yet at the same time, Germany is supposed to be a place where people are indoctrinated to have a very what's called dress right dress mentality. In other words, everything to the left and to the right should look exactly the same. It's also called a martinet mentality or a militaristic mentality. Now that could just be a reputation that's associated with the German people for a variety of reasons. And oftentimes you'll find that it's very incorrect as are most of the perceptions that were given of peoples across the land. And it seems to be very much by design. The reality is that Germany reflects everything that you see reflected across the land. You have individuals, some people believe some things, other people believe other things, and yet when you go across that land, you'll encounter some of the most friendly and welcoming people you can imagine, and you'll also encounter other individuals who seem to be more, how shall we say, conformist to what the mainstream account gives us. Yet going across this land, we see some of the most beautiful structures that still survive intact to this day starting with many of the wondrous castles that all happen to exist on the hills. And what's the true account with these castles? Are these a remnant from a previous civilization? Or were they simply manors, as we're told, that existed? 
The mainstream account will tell us that they were merely the residences of the feudal lords who ruled the lands at the time. And somehow they managed to build it, because despite the fact that the vast majority of the population, again we're told by the mainstream account, was uneducated and really didn't have any basic skills aside from working the land and being a basic human resource, that was to be used and exploited by the feudal lords. Somehow they managed to achieve building these incredible structures. Well, the mainstream has other explanations for that. No, there wasn't an industrial revolution yet, but the Renaissance had happened. And because the Renaissance happened, somehow they managed to acquire these immense building capabilities. These artisans and these craftsmen that were to be found all across the land could rapidly erect all these stunning castles. And then looking at another example of Dresden from the 1900s or the late 1800s, the incredible stations that existed with so much architectural detail and not one but two clocks on this one. Then you also have the many images of the town squares. A town square which seems to have some sort of centerpiece monument in it and well-developed architecture around it. And of course we're told this reflects the German concept of the Heimat or the small town. Interestingly enough you do see this reflected in the Midwestern United States to a great extent and even in the Southern United States. Dresden is a very impressive city from what we see in the older images prior to the destructive conflict of World War I and World War II. And you can see images that seem almost as though they were made from some sort of science fiction or fantasy land. Now you'll be told that you're simply using your imagination too much, that these were structures that were quite possible, all it took was additional effort and the infinite forms of money that were apparently available at that time. Many of these structures still endure to this day. Other structures do not endure to this day. And the question comes by us, why? Why is it that Germany, or why was it that Germany, managed to survive with so many of these structures intact? Was there some reason that it was spared the worst effects of the reset? Was there some practical reason that the reset conflict initially did not target Germany as much? Now, it should be noted there are accounts of fires, and indeed we'll look at the great fire that hit Hamburg in the 19th century in this video. But we still ask, why was it that the structure survived? What does it really reflect and tell us about the previous civilization? It seems as though the tracts of land that comprise Germany or Germania today and in the past were spared the worst effects of both the reset and the subsequent reset conflict. And you can see that evidenced in the remaining architecture that we still have images and accounts of from the early 1900s. Now, it should be noted that even our historical account as early or even up to the mid 20th century is at best highly questionable because anything can be changed. And one of the questions I've gotten from a viewer, and it's a very legitimate question is, how is it that people could have their entire history forgotten? How is it people could be changed from culture and language from one to another and done in a very short amount of time? Well, look very closely to what's happened in recent events. We have firsthand examples just within the last few years of how the entire perception of an entire society can be very easily manipulated and controlled. It's really not that difficult, especially when you consider the fact that Anybody who questions anything is very easily discredited simply by saying, well, you need to do more research. Yes, that's right. You need to do more research and you need to repeat things that you know are not true. Because if you ask some simple questions about them, you know they can't be true. For example, this lovely structure that we're looking at. Are you really just going to sit there and believe that craftsmen and artisans managed to do this in the 15th or 16th century? that they managed to achieve all this wonderful gothic architecture. They just worked harder. It's not just isolated structures either in Germany. You see it in entire cities. You see it in the layout of entire city blocks. And when you start to compare and contrast this, you realize there was a reason why this particular land had to be targeted and devastated. Now, of course, we'll be given the reasons that we're always given when there's a very devastating conflict from the 20th century to today. There was a very evil regime and we had to focus all the powers at our capability to destroy that regime. Because if we didn't, the entire fate of humanity was on the line. And that's usually the reason that we're given for why there needs to be a very destructive conflict 
and that hasn't changed to this day. Looking at some of the remnants, though, of the castles, whether it's Heidelberg Castle or any other castle, you can see the same architectural detailings that don't make a lot of sense. You can see an advanced construction, an advanced design. And in the older images, you can also see it in the size of many of the structures. It just simply doesn't make a lot of sense that Germany would have this capability, but it's also displayed that it was more than just building the one cathedral. And of course, if you study the history of Europe and the United States, you'll be told that these cathedrals and these castles were isolated singular efforts, and therefore it makes sense. They also had hundreds of years to do it, or even over a thousand years, depending on what account you look at when you examine the accounts of particular locations. And don't worry, we will be examining the account of each city, and even particular structures in Germany, that very easily defy what we're told in the mainstream account. We're going to examine each of these structures and the cities and their historical account and find out exactly where things don't line up and don't make a lot of sense. Now, I haven't done an overview exploration like this for any of the other areas that we've done, and I decided to do one for Germany. And the reason for that is explorations of Germany are difficult. For whatever reason, it seems as though alternative researchers have come across all sorts of issues when they've tried to lay out the examination of Germany. Now, it's always been easy enough if you just look at it in a little bit of a piece of an exploration or if you focus on one particular structure. But for whatever reason, looking at Germany or Germania as a whole seems to be something that is, how shall we say, difficult for a variety of reasons. Here's that fire that we have of Hamburg from the 19th century. Isn't that interesting? It looks like the fire is actually spewing from the tower of the building itself. Very interesting depiction of a fire. And then we do actually have supposedly a picture of the destruction, one of the very earliest pictures from the news, or so we're told, that shows the destruction of Hamburg. Quite interesting. Yet at the same time, isn't it also fascinating how this seems to be synonymous with all the destructive fires that we have going across the lands, especially the ones that we've looked at in the United States? It's also interesting that all the major structures outside of the castles and certain other ones in Germany, we're told, came about in the 19th century. Ah yes, the 19th century again. The century where anything was possible, where we could achieve anything. Of course, if you go back a little bit earlier, and then you know you could find that you could establish one of these great castles in under 36 hours. I'm sure if there was an account of it somewhere, and if it was written down, someone would tell you, it's very well documented. It's very well documented, and you just need to do more research, and you'll believe that this beautiful structure that you're looking at could very easily be constructed by the people of Germany in the 18th century in under 36 hours. They worked harder. What I also find interesting, though, is how much of the very ornate detail that survived in Germany. And that's on the inside and the outside of many of the structures. And I think that ornate detail that we see is what really paints the picture of just how truly advanced this incredible civilization was at that time. That's what we can't deny. And I think that really flashed in a lot of people's faces, especially in the early 20th century. Certainly the powers that be saw it and realized that as people would come across these lands, they would perhaps develop perceptions that they weren't supposed to develop. Perceptions that maybe what they're being told is not necessarily true about the given historical account. How is it that people who were uneducated and struggling to live to reach the age of 30 in the so-called Middle Ages or the medieval period were able to build these extraordinary castles and these wondrous cathedrals? I suppose you could just simply accept one, two, or three, or even one major castle or one major cathedral per large city. But how exactly could you accept it for all of these urban areas? And then it's not just the cities in Germany, it's also the villages and the smaller towns. You will see evidence of this more advanced architecture. You'll even see it in the old paintings and the old images that show you that there seem to be even greater capability. And these are no doubt the examples that most certainly were not allowed to survive past the mid 20th century, if not earlier. Looking at many of the images that we have of cities such as Munich, Frankfurt, and Dresden, we get the example though of how much had to be destroyed or altered or changed. Because even what exists to this day, it's only explained by the fact that, well, these were medieval times and these were Renaissance times and people just had to work and do as they were told and that's how they managed to achieve all these stunning castles. 
In fact, one of the very first explorations that I did on the channel involved looking at a book that was published by Stars and Stripes, an armed forces publication for the United States military, for all the American service members that were serving in Germany after World War II. And you might be asking the question, well, wait a minute, why would they have a bunch of American service members being allowed to go through Germany and then give them a publication on all these structures and all these cities in Germany? And as I posited in that original exploration, it's because they wanted to paint the picture of what Germany was supposed to be. If you're a foreigner, Germany was a fairy tale land. It was a land from the medieval times where they managed to achieve some of these stunning architectural achievements. You needed to put that in the minds of all those American service members so then when they went back home or they brought their families over with them, they went back home to the United States and they told all these stories of this fairy tale land. And yet they also had the mentality that all this was achieved during the medieval times. The whole reason there are beautiful castles in Germany is because it makes sense. It makes sense that there's beautiful castles because it existed during the time in previous centuries where they focused on building castles, where the feudal lords needed to defend their keep. And of course, they were going to have only the finest fortifications. Never mind the fact that in every map that you look at, every single city has a geometrically precise foundation structure. Star forts were always very good for defensive purposes. You can find no shortage of images from Germany where you can see castles on many hills and many different ridges. You can also find no shortage of images where you'll see very well-developed city areas. And of course, defenders of the mainstream account will tell you it's because there were all these artisans and craftsmen. And you know that earlier picture that we saw that showed some of what appeared to be workmen just sitting around having a little bit of a break. Yes, they certainly look like they belong with these buildings. They look like they could easily build these incredible towers, all these dome structures that we see. And yet at the same time, we do see many different architectural stylings in Germany. Again, the explanation will be it's because they wanted to appear neoclassical when they did. Even though, according to the official history, Germans resisted Roman influence and intervention. Well, when it suddenly became time that it was cool, so it were, to build like the Romans, then lo and behold, they decided to build like the Romans and completely disregarded the fact that they had a history of resisting Roman influence. Sort of like going back to Scotland, where we have that nice statue of Alexander and his horse, even though the official history of Scotland tells us that they resisted all neoclassical influence. Well, as the saying goes, they only resisted the influence until they didn't, and then suddenly it became cool, and now you needed to build your columns, your pillars, your domes. You needed to look just like Rome, because Rome was cool. At least that's what we'll be told. Fascinating, though, to see that Many of the elaborate structures match some of the structures that we've seen in the United States in many ways. And here's an example of it with the pediment, the column, and the pillars. And then you have another style, a Gothic style that will be told. And yet there's something about this Gothic style that almost seems like it would be more advanced than the neoclassical style as we're told. I think once again it proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that all these naming conventions and all these supposed architectural styles are merely assigned. They're designed to confuse us. They're designed so that we continue to repeat what we're given as the mainstream account, and we continue to mislead people, or if not directly mislead people, at least provide people a false understanding. A false understanding simply because it's the first understanding that they have. And then for the rest of their lives, they'll go about saying, no, you can't question that. That's the official history. It all makes sense. It makes sense because that's what I was taught first. And as the old saying goes, first to the truth tends to be the enduring truth. And by all means, let me know in the comments if you're thinking I'm misquoting that, and I've got a little response for you. These wondrous opera houses, though, and then contrast that with the incredible churches and cathedrals, and indeed, the very tallest church in the world was in Germany that we explored in our cathedral exploration. Nobody doubts the magnificent aspect, though, of some of the churches that are less well-known because you can still see it. You also have these towers or these tours, and what exact sense does this make? Well, they needed to defend themselves from all the roving bands of raiders that were going around in the medieval times. And of course, the Vikings. Yes, we love to talk about Vikings, don't we? Vikings, the very convenient excuse for everything in history. Looking at some of the layout, though, of the cities, the towns, and the villages, I think that's what paints the greatest picture of what Germany was and how, for some reason, it survived as a remnant of the previous civilization. For whatever reason, in this land, in this very 
small geographical area, and of course I say small by comparing it to other lands, we have more examples of the wondrous architecture that we were capable of in our previous civilization. It survived and it stood as a testament, something that completely contravened what we were given as the mainstream account. You can see it in the domes, you can see it in the different types of architecture, and yet at the same time we're supposed to accept the fact that the Germans, the people who were unified until they weren't unified, and who believed in having everything looking the same until they didn't believe in it, established all this. So really what it comes down to is that this area is the <laughs> very nexus of conflicting accounts. You have conflicting accounts in the history, you have conflicting accounts in what you see in all the structures that remain. And yet you see beauty and ornate detail in many aspects that exceed anything that you would expect anybody to be capable of. Not just in the 15 and 1600s, but also now in the 21st century. Because again, who's building like this now in the 21st century? Oh, don't worry though, we can give you lots of square glass and steel skyscrapers. They're tall, they're tall. Granted, you can't use most of the space, and we talked about that in other explorations. But they're taller, and therefore, they're more magnificent. Never mind the fact that you can't use them. Well, I don't know, maybe I'm just out in some other form of existence, but I find these images of Germany from the early 1900s and the late 1800s to be very impressive. The many different towers that reach to the sky. The very incredible layout of the cities. Going all the way back to their original geometrically precise foundation structures. And yet you can see a more complex grid pattern to many of the cities. A grid pattern that seemed to work more geometric patterns. Not just the straight lines that we tend to see in a lot of the United States cities, but also more of a circular pattern. And that's reflected in the architecture. It almost seems as though, for whatever reason, this was a more advanced phase of the previous civilization that somehow managed to survive in Germany. At least until a lot of it was destroyed by the very, very unfortunate, yet very, very necessary global conflicts that we had in the 20th century. And yes, I say global tongue-in-cheek. Yet we still see some of the same architecture that we see in the United States, indicating that it was from the same civilization. Now, another good comment that I saw was that people tried to explain cities in the United States, such as Cincinnati and Milwaukee, being built by Germans because they had this incredible building capability. They were artisans, and they were craftsmen, and they were very skilled. But then the question they asked is, why would these people who were so skilled even be allowed to leave Germany in the 19th century? The official account tells us that uh, Germany under the Kaiser wasn't exactly a friendly place. It wasn't exactly a place where individual rights reigned supreme. Of course, we can argue that until we're blue in the face. But regardless of what type of government they supposedly had and what the true account was, why would anybody allow a bunch of skilled artisans and craftsmen to leave their nation? and then go to the United States. And of course, that's what we examine. And there's also an interesting connection in the mainstream account between Germany and the United States. In fact, many places in the United States, like Cincinnati and Milwaukee, and even many of the small Midwest towns that we've examined across places such as Iowa and Illinois, were told that they were built by Germans, that Germans could pretty much do anything. At least until they weren't able to do anything, which was, you know, about World War II or around that time frame. Because that's when the United States gave up its impressive building capability and decided to go to more brutalist and the lovely architecture that we see now. I think that Germany and the images that we have of it survive as a testament to what was no doubt the very pinnacle of humanity in the previous civilization, in the Fourth Era. And coming very soon, we're going to be exploring exactly the theory behind how that civilization collapsed and what were the series of events that led to humanity no longer having the capability to erect these incredible structures. Now there's an argument that perhaps we still have the capability or at least some very small and esoteric sect that still exists within humanity has the knowledge and the capability to erect these structures and they simply decide either not to share it or not to practice it. And there may be something to that argument. It may be true that the capability to build cities and towns like this and to 
erect these incredible structures that seem to defy our very dreams and are difficult to explain through fantasy, that knowledge still exists somewhere with someone. And we're going to be focusing on trying to identify what examples we have that show that that capability still exists to this day. I have to say, though, that after looking at these images of Germany, starting with Berlin and now all these other impressive images that we see in all these other cities across the land of Germany, you can see something that truly inspires and speaks to the baseline of the human spirit. It's something that is incredibly inspirational, and it's something that we can feel has the human touch within it, something that could only come from a human being's creative desires that are unleashed. This was not designed by a computer, this was not designed by a program, this was not designed by artificial intelligence. We're going to be exploring the Tartarian area on live stream on the 29th, so please join us and make sure you set that reminder. And finally, as we conclude the initial exploration in the Tartarian era, we're also going to be getting back to the United States and exploring St. Augustine, more U.S. castles and a star city. Well, I hope you enjoyed this overview exploration. It's been a pleasure to present and look at Germany. Please like, comment, and subscribe.